I am um, like you. I mean, over the the coming couple of years, I've um, listened to a lot of things online. We were kind of forced to, weren't we, in a way, you know? Uh, and um, I, I was blessed by listening to a lot of good teaching online. Um, and I listened to quite a few street preachers. Um, and um, preachers from Canada and Australia and America uh, and India um, and a number of different places from all around the world. Uh, it, it was great to see these guys out there preaching. Uh, but they had two things in common. One, they all preached the same message, the gospel, Christ crucified. And the second thing they had in common, they were all persecuted. They were all opposed for what they were saying about Jesus. They were all abused. People were trying to stop them, take their mic from them, kick over their stuff, wreck their tracts and literature. The police were called. The police stopped them there and threatened to arrest them. Why was that? Because they were preaching the gospel. The same message that we responded to, I don't know when, but we're all, we all have that in common, don't we? Here tonight that we're here because at some point in our life we heard the gospel and we believed it to be true and we surrendered to Jesus and he changed our life. Amen. And it's the same message. This is the, this is the joy. It's the same message that we hear about in the early church. Same message passed on through the ages. And you and I have that, we've been entrusted with the same message that Paul heard, that Timothy heard, that all those apostles and disciples heard. <coughs> we've been entrusted with the same message. And we have a bit of responsibility, don't we, in a way? What do you feel? When you think of that, I, I, I use the illustration of you imagine someone <coughs> in a relay race over the, over the 2,000 years and that runner is passing the baton on and he's passing it on. Every time he gets to a station where he's got to pass it over, he's trusting that that person's there in place to take it on. And we, here we are the baton's been passed on to us in this generation. <coughs> and we have a responsibility with that message. Romans <coughs> 1, 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Mark 16, 16, 15, go throughout the whole world and preach the gospel to all mankind. And John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Finish it for me. That's right. The next verse is, for God didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world from his sins. It's an amazing message that we have got. No other religion has this message. <coughs> Muslims, Sikhs, Hindus, Buddhists, what they've got is hopeless beliefs. We believe that, don't we? In a way, it's very sad. And they need the gospel because what they're believing in is not the truth. It's lies. It's almost born in, the, in hell itself. And this is what we believe. That Jesus is the only way to salvation. 
And, and we have got, just think about this, guys. We have got the answer for salvation. We're the only ones on this planet, we Christians, who've got that message that's been given to us by God himself. Remember when Jesus, before he left, he says, here's the message, guys. Go into the world with it and rescue people. It's a great, great message. But now listen here. It's a message that is under attack. It's a message that's being undermined. It's a message that the devil knows it's a powerful message and he's going to do all he can to stop it. And it, he shot himself in the foot, didn't he, really? Because in, in, in the COVID period, when all the churches were closed, the devil must have thought, yes, result. The gospel is not going out anymore because the churches have shut up and that's finished them. But God had other plans. And we discovered afresh the internet. We discovered that actually Dave can preach a message from his home, in his bedroom, in his office, and he can put it online and it can go around the world. The gospel was still going out. And lot, I heard lots of fabulous testimonies. People were prophesying online, encouraging one another online. There were groups, there were messages going all out across the world. Because God had other plans. And his message is so important. That he doesn't want it held up in any way, shape or form. And he weren't going to let the devil spoil his plans. But we are under attack. Ephesians 6 and 12, we fight not against flesh and blood. You know the scripture. But now listen here. This is where we miss something in that scripture. And it's this. We fight. We fight. It isn't a passive word. It's an action word. We know we're fighting against the devil. Paul tells us that. And we're not just defending ourselves against the devil. We're on the, we're on the attack ourselves. Thank God that he's given us discernment of spirits where we can see the devil at work. And we can come in and we can fight for God. And we can win battles for the Lord. We fight. We don't have time to fall asleep. We're called to watch and pray. Do you know this week, 50 Nigerian Christians were murdered? 50 faithful Christians. They came out of church and they were murdered by, I think it was Islamic terrorists or whatever you want to call them. They were opposers to the gospel. And we know, even in our own country, not at that level, of course, but persecution is creeping in more fully. There's a negativity against the church that's growing, and it means the church is under attack. Why? Because the devil is frightened for the church to be alive to the word of God and to the power of the gospel to save. So he's going to do all he can to undermine the church. And you know, you've heard the stories. Remember the, 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 the guys, the bakers, who were uh, asked to bake a cake for the homosexuals and they said, we're not going to do it. It's against our Christian beliefs. They were persecuted terribly to the point where they nearly had nervous breakdowns. And remember the woman who was wearing a cross at work and they said, can you take that cross off? Because it's causing offence to some people. And, 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 and in a chaplain, a, 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 a chapel, in, in um, a hospital, 
were they at a cross. The authorities came along and said, uh, we want to remove this cross because it's an offence to certain people. All the time, teachers who are opposed to the, the, the homosexual push, doctors, you name it, pastors, Christians are being victimised because of the gospel, because of what they believe. And that's why we have to stand firm. But there are these, the devil's very crafty, and he's sowing into the church alternative messages to deceive and spoil. And some of these messages, you might think, yeah, that's right, that is a message that's coming in. Global warming. I'll run through some, some things that are coming into the church and they're undermining the gospel. And the devil is sowing them in there because he wants to confuse, he wants to spoil, he wants to undermine truth with lies and subtleties. And global warming is one of those issues. It's almost become a religion. I was in a church recently. My word, they had a double big bald spread of global warming and what the church is going to do and plan to do. To, and one of the, the, interesting, one of the themes of global warming is save the planet and we save ourselves. That's one of their themes. If we can just save this planet, we'll all be all right. My word, this planet is going to outlive people. The, 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 the way things are deteriorating rapidly now. But I, I know it's coming across as a little bit negative, but actually this message is positive because it's positive towards the gospel. We've got to be aware of what's happening in our society because it's in the church, guys. It's in the church. All what I'm going to tell you now is in the church. That's where I've heard it and seen it. Now, that great big display about global warming, when I looked around the church for anything on the gospel, on the truth, couldn't find a thing. But there was the display and everything the church was going to get involved in to do. Now, of course, if you go back to Genesis, God says, I want you to look after this garden. You have a responsibility. We do. We all do our bit. But there's an agenda here. This global warming is bigger than us. And it's being manipulated by wealthy people and politicians that have all got their fingers on the button and their, and their hands in the trough. Uh, and it's wheeling and dealing. The hypocrisy is crazy. It really is crazy. But that's one thing that's creeping in the church. So when I hear the church at the front, and, and Dave might even come along and say to us, guys, we've got to consider you know, how we behave towards our planet. I can embrace that, because that's true. But the agenda that's being pushed in some churches is not just that simple message of responsibility. It's more than that. Social care. Many churches think that social care is the gospel. That it's the gospel. We know we're called to be salt and light. We know we, we are called to help the poor and needy. We know that. That's a part of our, our love for God. But it isn't the gospel. It isn't the gospel. And churches do social care brilliantly. And they have done for hundreds of years. And I am not knocking that. I'm saying thank you, God, that we do this so well. But it isn't the gospel. And a bag of shopping is not going to save anyone. It might create a bit of interest. They might think, why are they doing that? Why is the church so caring? That's a good thing, isn't it? But it doesn't save anyone. And do you know what? If everyone who received the bag of shopping were converted with that bag of shopping, this country would belong to God today. It's true, isn't it? We have done incredible works in social care across the nation. 
but you know what? And I don't know what you feel about this. There's been some fantastic work that started gospel-centered, but the gospel is dropped off. Yeah. It's dropped off. It started with the gospel in the center, Jesus on the cross, dying for our, our sins, but that dropped off, and now it's become a good work. Canadian friends of ours, they teach English to refugees. Great. But they use the Bible to do it. That's clever. The authorities said, well, we don't want this. So what did the church say? Well, in that case, we're not doing it. Go find someone else to do it. We're not doing it. They won that battle because they fought for it, because they know it was important alongside the caring and the learning of the English language. The greatest thing that they could ever learn is that Jesus loved them and died for their sins. That balance is needed in our social care. The good news of love and acceptance. That's another message that's going in. We've got to love everybody because God is love and Jesus loves everyone. And we've got to accept everyone, warts and all, and no matter what their sexuality, no matter what their beliefs are, what their behaviours are, we've got to love everyone and welcome them into the church. It's called inclusion, the inclusive church. Now, in a, in a sense, that's what we are. We include everyone that comes through those doors and we love them and we care for them. But that doesn't mean to say that we accept everything they do and their behaviours because we say, look at that. Does it match up to that cross? Inclusive church, for some, is accepting the homosexual way of life, allowing people to lead worship, allowing people to be pastors and leaders, that's not right. But that's in the church. That's crept in. And that's another agenda. Because what it says is, is do we really need Jesus? Because homosexuality isn't sin. And therefore, do we need the cross? Do we need a saviour? It's a challenge to the gospel when we accept that kind of behaviour. And it undermines the truth about God. It goes further to accept same-sex marriage. The Anglican Church in Wales and Scotland have accepted same-sex marriage now. The Archbishop of Canterbury has appointed uh, a same-sex uh, secretary. And more good news is that there is no hell. There is no hell. You, you don't need the cross. Because the God of love, according to Steve Chalk, is not going to punish anyone. No one's going to hell. This completely undermines the gospel and what Jesus says. Hebrews 9.27, everyone must die and after that be judged by God. Matthew 13.42, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire and they shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth, Jesus says. And Matthew, sorry, Matthew 25.41 says, then he shall say to those on his left, depart from me, you are cursed into everlasting fire. This is Jesus saying this about hell and about judgment. How can any born-again Christian say there is no hell, there is no punishment? You need to read the Bible. But these people are in the church and they're undermining truth. And this is the fight that we have. And this is why it is a fight that we have to recognise. All roads lead to God. That's another one. Multi-faith services. We have so much in common with Muslims and Sikhs and Hindus. After all, 
We all worship the same God. What a load of rubbish. We do not worship the same God as Muslims and Sikhs and Hindus and Buddhists. We worship the one and only God. And you cannot find salvation in anyone else other than Jesus Christ. He himself said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. We cannot have fellowship with Muslims and Sikhs and Hindus. We can't do that. We're compromising our faith. I don't know what you feel about that. I hope you agree with me on that. It's a hard one. We must love everyone from other faiths. And I'm not saying that, you know that. But we cannot share the pulpit with them. We cannot worship because we worship a different God. And they must know that. Evolution is taught as fact over creation. And academia is determined to move, remove God from the giver of life. And they'll do all they can to do so. More worldly good news is that a man can become a woman. And a woman can become a man. And did you know there's 90 different genders? I only thought there was two. This is revelation to me, isn't it to you? I just thought there was two. I only see two in the Bible. But apparently, according to the world and many Christians, there's more than two today. There's 90. Wow. And when you see a trans, trans woman married to a trans man and the trans woman is trying to breastfeed a baby, you know we're in wacky land. But in the church, these things are accepted. We might as well take down the cross. If it ever happened in Elim, and it never will, I know with Pastor Dave and you guys here, but my word, take down the cross, if you ever get to that stage, where you're compromising so much that you're agreeing with some of this drivel that's out there. And when politicians and other people are asked, can you define a woman? And they're struggling, you know, my word, we've lost the plot. We've lost the plot. And I don't know about you, but me as a Christian, I just put my head in my hands and I say, Lord, Lord, deliver us from this, please. That's what stirs me up, you know. It stirs me up. New Age in the church, that's another one. My word. What about a message I listened to uh, a week ago um, by a, a woman in a church preaching? He's talking about um, prophecy. She, she gets prophetic words from, for people from um, the themes of um, Disney films. Um, in their home group, they pass around sweet wrappers and they get messages from the different sweet wrappers that they give to one another. My word. And I think I mentioned to, to Dave, I went to a prophecy conference. It was nothing what I expected more than they advertised it. But the, the chap leading the worship uh, talked about all of us having an inner sound. And if you find that inner sound and you, you, you give that sound back to God, it becomes a prayer for the nation and the city. Absolute new age drivel. It is, isn't it? But guys, this is in the church. I'm not talking about the world. I expect drivel from the world. But these things I'm talking about are in the church. Bill Johnson's church, Bethel, they have a supernatural school where Christians are taught how to use 
tarot, Christian tarot cards. And that's true. This is Bethel Church. Remember when church leaders, remember when church leaders used to walk around the buildings with uh, staffs, wooden staffs. Do you remember that period? You might not have been here, Dave. But I was in the city when all the church leaders, the charismatic leaders, would have these wooden staffs that they'd walk around banging the floor and waving in the air and declaring this and that. What was all that about? They were like deluded Gandalfs going around the buildings. It was madness. Where, where did it come from? We maybe had some idea of something in the Bible, like Moses holding his staff up or his arms being held up. And we almost take that and try to make it into some theology of some sort. When in fact, we've embraced in worldly practices that are not of God. Our children, oh my. Do you know our children are being... I was talking with an ed teacher this week and we was talking about mental health in schools. Our children are being bombarded with alternative messages that are contrary to the word of God. They're contrary to the teaching that their parents give them. They're contrary to the teaching that youth workers are giving to them. There's humanists going into schools. There's atheists going into schools. There's LGBT people going into schools. Our kids we need to pray for. No wonder they're confused when you've got five and six-year-olds with men dressed as women talking to them about they might be somebody else inside that wants to come out. How confusing is this to our children? And the sad thing is, these things are embraced in church. And there are Christians who are fighting for people like this to go into schools. And the literature, you'd be horrified at the sex education books that are in schools today. You'd think it's pornography, but they're in the schools. And our children are having to read these. And teachers whose lives are messed up are instructing them in ways that you'd be horrified. They don't, do you know some of our young people? Don't tell their parents what they're having to contend with because their parents might be up school causing a bit of a havoc and create problems for them. They keep it to themselves. But boy, our kids are under pressure today by these groups that seek to come in. And now we can see that Paul talks about we fight not against flesh and blood because the instigator of all this rubbish is the devil. But, but let's face it, it's the devil that's captured the hearts of, I don't even want to say Christian men and women. I don't even want to say that because they should know better if they read the word and that's a problem. The Bible is not taught. We're, we're fortunate here. But in many churches, the Bible isn't taught. The Bible is just an historic book of stories and fables. It's not believed. No wonder we've got new age in the church. No wonder these things are there. Because the Bible is our manual. When you can weigh it up with a word, you can believe it. If you can't weigh it up in the word, if it's not there, question it big time. Now, this final ten minutes or so, I want to remind us of a story in the Bible that's very relevant for this. Dave mentioned it a couple of weeks ago. It's the story of Gideon and the Midianites. And it's very relevant when it comes to fighting. Because I want you to hold on to that. Because God is looking for people who are willing to fight for the truth. Do, do, do we, can we get that? It is so important that God raises an army 
of faithful followers who are not going to put up with some of this stuff that's out there. It's out there because Christians haven't fought hard enough, haven't prayed hard enough. And boy, do we pray and boy, do we fight. But you know what? It's in the church. How can you have practising homosexual clergy and priests and leaders? How can, how can this be? How did we ever let it get this bad? That there's so much new age in the church. The people who are talking about Disney films and sweet rappers are there at the front teaching the congregation. I wish they'd preach the gospel because many more people would be saved. But the gospel is not being preached. It's being neglected. But this story is fabulous. You know the story. The Israelites were again into idol worship. And God was disappointed with them. But they cried out to God for deliverance. And God is merciful and he heard their cry. And there was Gideon. I'm going to race through the story because you know it well. There was Gideon in the wine press. Angel appears to him, says, Gideon, mighty warrior. He wondered who he was talking to, but it was Gideon because God saw him in a different light. I've got a job for you to do. We've got a fight on our hands. Uh, and he told Gideon to raise an army. And Gideon raised 32,000 men. And God said, that's too big. He said, those who are fearful of the fight can go home. There's a message straight away. Those who are fearful of the fight, off you go. God is gracious, he's merciful, but they weren't ready for this fight. And the fact is, there are many Christians who are, let me leave it to others, someone else to fight. I'm going home to put my feet up in front of the telly. Others can do the battling. Yeah, it's true, isn't it? It is absolutely true. And God says, still, there's too many. You've got 10,000 here, but there's too many. What I want you to do is send them down to the river, and however they drink, that's going to be the way I'm going to decide who you're going to choose. He said, if they lay down and drink like a dog, lapping, they're going home. And he sent another 9,700 home. Why did he send that group home? What was it that they was doing? What do you think, guys? What, what, what was it? Why did God say, send that lot home? That, that do that? What do you think? Uh, I, I don't know what you feel, but I, I think it's because their eye was off the ball. They were, they were focused on themselves because they needed refreshing. Do you know a lot of animals lose their lives at the water drinking hole and ponds and rivers because the crocodiles, you've seen them, they're in the water watching. The big cats are around. And soon as the animal takes his eye off the ball, because he's focused on his thirst, meeting his own need, they pounce. And that's where they lose their lives. And that's what God saw. When they were so focused on their own needs of refreshment to the point where they weren't watching what was going on around them, God said, that's it, send them home. But those that kneel, that cup and drink and watch as they're doing so, they're the ones that will choose. There's a message with that second group that sometimes the church gets so focused in on himself. God, meet my needs. You know, fill me, help me, you do this for me. So self-centred that we have our eye off the ball and these things creep into church and before you know where you are, we bring our eyes up and we think, what? Where did that come from? Oh yeah, I was focused on myself and not watching what was going on around. 
He chooses these 300. They were ready to fight. They'd refreshed themselves, but they were ready for the fight. It's a great message in this story. But there's a bit of a confusion here, isn't there? Because Jesus says, love your enemies, pray for them. Those that persecute them, persecute you, love them. It's a difficult one, isn't it, when we're talking about fighting. We're not talking about physical fights, but we are talking about our spiritual fight. And that might even mean challenging people for what they're doing and what they're saying. But we do need to fight. And Jesus made a whip. I think I said this last time I preached. Jesus made a whip and he drove them out of the temple because he said, you're abusing the temple and I'm not going to put up with it. And if you're up for a fight, I am. And he turned the tables over and he drove them out with a whip. Do you know, I think we need a bit of that in church. We need the, this army of 300 to say, do you know what? Enough is enough. We're not putting up with this anymore. We're going to challenge it. Let me ask you a question. Do you think you'd have been one of the 300 chosen? Or one of those sent home in the first wave? Or the second wave? We, uh, when I hear stories like this, I love to think of myself... I'd have been in the 300. I would have been sent home early. Interesting, isn't it? What about Joshua's army? Would you have been chosen in that? Or would you have been one of the Israelites that complained and wandered around in circles until you died? What about David's 30 valiant warriors, they're called, they're in the Bible, what they did. They'd do anything for the king. They'd do anything for the king. They'd give their life and their stories in the Bible of bravery for their king. They're not interested in themselves. It's a challenge to us today. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 to 13, talks about times and seasons. There is a time to be quiet and a time to speak up. There's a time to plant and there's a time to root up. I think the time is now to speak up. I think the time is now to pull up some of those roots, those weeds that are growing in the church. What do you think? I honestly feel that. I feel I'm up for a fight and I know you do as well. The church is scoring a lot of own goals. We like to think of the church as a battleship. But in fact, I think it's more like a cruiser in some places. Like a passenger ship that's just carrying people along, that having lots of fun. Do you know there's pastors in Canada who refused to close their doors of their churches in the pandemic that are still in prison? Because they were not going to stop preaching the gospel for anyone. And one pastor was in solitary confinement for 90 days just for keeping his church doors open and opposing the authorities. I take my hat off to him for his courage. That's what happened. Society wants you and I to shut up and keep quiet. Not to speak about what's going on in the world, not to bring our messages of hope and truth. Keep that to yourself. 
Society is not worried about the church on the corner that just keeps itself to itself. It's when we spill out into the community with the gospel of Christ. That's when society gets worried. And who makes them worried? The devil stirs them up and says, look what they're doing. Who do they think they are? That's the battle we're up against, guys. When Stephen was being stoned, he was praying for people and witnessing right to death. Most of the apostles, they died for their faith. Do you know what the emperor felt about Christians? Why he punished them so much? Because he felt they didn't fight for what they believed. They had, he had, Nero had more respect for the Jews, although the church was made up of many Jews. He had more respect for those who fought for what they believed because that was Rome. They were a fighting body of people. So someone had come along who were more passive and put up with stuff, they, they couldn't get their head around it. And many died because they weren't prepared to fight. We have got to run with that baton that God has given us and not be afraid to fight. The end of this story was a great victory because it says, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. All they was armed with, that 300, was a torch, a clay pot, and a trumpet. And Gideon separated the 300 into, into three groups of 100, and he said, what I want you to do is at the given call, shout out for the Lord and Gideon, smash your pots, shine your lights, and blow your trumpets. And the Midianites all started to fight one another when that took place. And there was a great victory. And you know God wants to do great things? Miraculous things? Things that would surprise us and shock us? But I believe this. The time is coming when we have got to take the church back for God. I believe that. Elon Church... I would say, and Dave, I think you'd agree with me on this, uh, they're, they're following the Lord as best they can. They're not embracing some of the drivel that's out there. They're trying to be faithful to God and the Word, and I praise God for that. But how many churches are they in the eyes of God? There's only one church. There's only one church. It meets in lots of different places. Pray for the church of God, those churches that are embracing a lot of stuff. And where we can, speak up, speak out, and try as best we can to uproot some of the rubbish. Do you agree with me? I hope this message has been just a reminder of what's actually happening up there, because we can't put the drawbridge up and say, we'll let them get on with it. It's nothing to do with me, because that would be like one of the, 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 the waves that went back home rather than the fault in, in Joshua's 300. We can't do that. We have to face up to what's going on, because remember this, come right back to what I started with, the power of the gospel message. And we, we must never stop giving it away, because that's when the power's released. It's not when we keep it to ourselves or keep it in the word, it's when we give it away, it becomes powerful, because it saves people from sin and death.